Episode 60. Today is Tuesday, September the 25th, 2012. I am your host, Christina Consolo, and I am sick today. Luckily, we have an interview to play from Arnie Gunderson. He was interviewed on Capital Forum with Tom Ritter over the weekend. It was an excellent interview. Arnie's interviewed with him many times before. You can find a list at the Fairwind site or on RBN's network. There's a slide presentation that goes along with the interview. It's about 42 minutes long. And afterward, we need to review some breaking news from St. Louis and Fukushima and from the sinkhole, as well as World War III watch and the significance of today's date. So enjoy the interview. This is Arnie Gunderson on Capitol Forum with Tom Ritter. Today is Sunday. September 23rd, 2012, and we're going to have a great show lined up for you this morning, and I hope everybody's tuned in and uh, welcoming their family and friends to tune in as well, because we're going to have a great show on two of the mo- most pressing issues that I consider us facing today. Obviously, we have spiritual and moral issues that are facing us worldwide, but uh, we have two issues, uh, both the uh, nuclear industry, some of the misgivings in that industry, and the threat of nuclear war, obviously, is always looming over our heads. And we're going to discuss that with Arnie Gunnarsson here in the first hour. And in the second hour, we're going to cover some uh, another pressing issue, which is genetically modified organism. So we have uh, two great issues lined up, and we also have two great guests that can discuss the issues and also solutions. And that's what we try to focus on here on Capital Forum on RBN, RepublicBroadcasting.org, is solutions. And a lot of people do a very good job of pointing out the problems that we have, but not very many people are out there actually trying to accomplish something to actually learn lessons and actually um, make a difference in the world for all of us. And uh, one of those people, obviously, is Arnie Gunnarsson. He's very much a uh, household name, a household face, but if you have not heard of Arnie, he is a leading expert in the nuclear industry, has uh, worked with many nuclear power plants, I believe 70-plus nuclear power plants, and uh, very much uh, uh, just tons of experience in this field to uh, speak towards some of the situations that's going on in our world, and obviously one of which is Fukushima. Barney, are you with us this morning? Yeah, hi. Happy uh, second day of uh, fall here. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, Arnie, what did you do on summer vacation? <laughs> I think you made a trip around the world, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I, I spent 10 days in Japan, actually. Yeah, I just got back. Excellent. And we're, we're going to have a, a, a three-minute commercial break coming up just real quick. But, um, Arnie, just, just briefly, uh, why why are you actually discussing this? Why aren't you like most nuclear experts and just sitting in this, on the sidelines and just just watching things happen as they play out. Why are, why are you in the field actually trying to make a difference? Uh, you know, I was an expert on the Three Mile Island trial, and, and I saw my government try to cover up Three Mile Island. And when, when Fukushima happened, I told Maggie, I said, I, I don't care what the personal cost is. I'm going to prevent that from happening this time. So I really just dedicated the last 18 months to, to getting out there. Excellent. And um, I wish more and more people would do the same thing you're doing, Arnie. I know, I know, uh, we have to put you up on a pedestal somewhat as, as a leading expert in this field and, and admire what you're doing for the rest of us. But I, I wish you were just one of the thousand people that are doing the same thing. And uh, we'll probably discuss that a little bit more into, on the next side, on the other side of the break. And uh, everybody, please support the sponsors of RBN, and we'll see you on the other side of the break. The things of today. 
Welcome back to Capital Farm, and thankfully to uh, Maggie and Arnie Gunnarsson, uh, they're not letting us forget about what happened in Fukushima and what could happen here in the United States or just uh, you name the country around the world and uh, an event like this could happen because we have nuclear power plants. And here in the United States, I believe we have 23 of uh, those type of nuclear power plants that are, that are uh, in uh, Fukushima. But, uh, Arnie, before the break, I actually mentioned why are you one of the lone people that are speaking out and also, have you met resistance from the nuclear industry itself and from the government of the United States in, on issues like this? Um, uh, yes, I, yeah, yeah, we have. You know, it's um, uh, the, the NEI, the, the trade organization, constantly goes after us on Twitter feeds and things like that. Um, and uh, you know, whenever I'm uh, whenever I'm out on the uh, um, on the radio, there'll be uh, I think they have a. A, a sheet, you know. Let's go after Arnie by, by 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 talking about these specific issues. But but really, you know, the I think that's a, a sign that the broader audience is listening. Um, I mean, they wouldn't be attacking me if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't making a dent in their bottom line. So I, I think uh, you know, um, as you as people begin to listen and understand, the uh, the industry will dig in its heels and, and fight even harder. And also part of that is the actual government itself. It seems like you've got some heavy hand in us coming back from the government, probably not only United States, but from Japan as well. Boy, you know, I, I've seen that. Um, uh, it's, it's, they, they are basically ignoring experts that are not inside. The Japanese call it the nuclear village. Uh, here we call it the nuclear priesthood. But um, there's, there's a couple of examples of that. They, um, the, the National Academy of Sciences was chartered to look at the Fukushima Daiichi accident. And uh, their first meeting, who did they have to tell them about the accident but Tokyo Electric hmm. and the American Institute for Nuclear Preparedness. You know, now, I've written a book on the accident, and, and I don't get an invite. And basically, <laughs> the industry insiders are talking to the National Academy of Sciences it, um, you know, and we've had panels like that in the past, whether it's the you know, 9-11 panel or the Three Mile Island panel, but the, the National Academy of Sciences panel is made up of insiders, and who do they call to testify but more insiders? Exactly right, and you, as you indicated, I think the public is still very hungry for the truth about this situation because they would know how they're going to be affected and what they can do about it. I noticed uh, a lot of times that you share on not only this radio show but other radio shows, there's a lot of YouTubers that pick up the audio track, and there's uh, websites that repost your information, and I really applaud all those people out there that are doing that, taking this information and taking it to the next step and dispersing it any and every way they can because what what you're presenting with, with, with us about what your situation is, is your understanding of the situation, I should say, is very important and uh, and sorely needed, and uh, I wish more and more people would do the same. So. Uh, we all thank you, Arnie, for what you guys are doing, and uh, you just no, recently went with Go ahead. This show will probably wind up in three different languages in the next four days. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, scary, isn't it? <laughs> well, tell us about uh, what happened in Japan, why you went there, and, and what the results of that were, and what your conclusions, what you presented to the Japanese audience. Yeah, I was, um, I was sponsored to, by just a group of citizens, uh, no organization or anything like that, and and um, you know, I, I, we didn't we didn't charge, but they they paid my my airfare over. And, uh, but in any event, um, the uh, I had a, a pretty much a speech a day for nine days, including um, including to the Diet, which is their their parliament. It was in the Diet office building, and there was about a dozen parliamentarians there, plus about three hundred people. And the Japanese are different than the Americans. You don't get any. Feedback as a speaker, you know, when when you're an American speaker, the people will be nodding or, or you know, giving you some kind of encouragement. And the Japanese are, are flat, and, it's, and it's, you got to get used to that. But so I gave a, a speech. It was two hours, and um, in it I had showed slides of nuclear fuel burning. It, it's up on our up on the Fairwinds website, and um, so the people had seen nuclear fuel burning in air. Uh, which is a Sandia National Labs test. So after I finished, I didn't realize it, but Tokyo Electric came in uh, with NISA, the, the regulator, and they spoke for about 20 minutes about uh, the, the fuel pool at Unit 4, which is everybody's concern, and how, don't worry, in the next five years they'll take care of it. 
So I got up then and, and I asked, I said, real respectively, I, I said, I realize you don't believe that the fuel pool is going to crack in an earthquake. I understand that that's your position. I said, but if it does, have you prepositioned chemicals on site to put out the fire? Because it's a special kind of fire. And they, and they said, there's nothing in the fuel pool to burn. Mm. And the crowd went nuts. Wow. This was a crowd that's normally flat. They started screaming at Tokyo Electric. So it was, you know, it was a switch. They were, they were flat and then they were the, the loudest crowd I've ever heard. So there's mm. a, an enormous amount of distrust in Japan for the regulator, NISA, and also for Tokyo Electric. And what you speak of, I believe, four is not is four the one that's actually leaning and is very susceptible to uh, further damage if a if a, a major earthquake happens. Yeah, four is the uh, the one where all of the nuclear fuel is outside the containment. And if there was a major earthquake, the, yeah, it's likely the pool would crack because, like you said, it's leaning. It also has a a crack on one side of it that Tokyo Electric tried to. Um, uh, tried to um, Photoshop out of one of the pictures, but they did such a poor job it actually highlighted the crack. And um, it also has a bulge down low, which is something called a first mode Euler strut buckle. But in any event, it's a seismically induced bulge in the building. So, yeah, it's um, it re- will remain in jeopardy until they can get that fuel out of there. Now, for <clears throat> regular listeners of Capital Farm, which is broadcast on RBN, will know that I, Tom Ritter, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired uh, aerospace scientist, and having worked in that field for 20-plus years, I a big part of any kind of engineering program is, is a project, is a lesson learned, as what you take away from any situation, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. You try to learn from your experience. And I, I noticed on uh, one of your videos, your recent videos, you elaborate on some of the things that are going on and some of the lessons we should have learned. And uh, can you share that with the audience this morning, what what we should have learned and what they're doing with the information they learned and what they should be doing if they're not doing it correctly? Um, Yeah, there's a a bunch of lessons learned uh, that are not being um, uh, implemented. In the United States, uh, uh, the the first one is this, um, what we call loss of the ultimate heat sink. And the question there is ultimate, you know. Um, you have to dump the heat from a nuclear reactor. Even after it's shut down, there's a lot of heat. And um, let's look at Fort Calhoun up there on the, on the Missouri River. The, um, the river is the, is the source of dumping the heat. Um, and if you lose the river, uh, either because it gets way too high or it gets way too low, um, you can't dump the heat from a nuclear reactor. Well, um, the NRC published, uh, uh, no, it didn't publish. They had an internal study of the risk of um, of a plant being uh, basically hit by a tsunami. But but in the case of Fort Calhoun, it it's not a tsunami. It's if if an upstream dam were to burst, uh, you would get the same effect as a tsunami. You know, this dam would cascade down the Missouri and 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 flood Fort Calhoun. Up to the level of above the um, um, the control room, so it's a lot of water. Um, and um, an NRC whistleblower came forward and he said that the report is being suppressed by the NRC. The NRC's position was, well, it's a security matter; we don't want terrorists attacking our dams. But the whistleblower uh, was clever enough, and he said, well, we already have talked to the Department of Homeland Security, and they don't care if the report is released. So the real reason the report was was sequestered was that the NRC didn't want to be embarrassed by the fact that they've known that the Fort Calhoun plant up there on the Missouri is um, is subject to um, a problem almost identical to, to Fukushima. The, the ultimate heat sink could flood the control room. Then you got another one down to the other side of you over in South Carolina. You're, you guys are surrounded here. <laughs> the wow. Oconee units uh, are are downstream of a huge hydroelectric dam. You know, now hydroelectric dams don't fail very often, but neither do 65-foot tsunamis occur very often. And uh, if that dam were to break, three nuclear plants would melt down for sure. Wow. And the NRC, again, has known about this for 15 years. And um, then they keep trying to sweep it under the rug, except for this NRC whistleblower coming forward. So that's just one lesson learned from from uh, Fukushima Daiichi that that or, is or not, lesson not there. You go, or not learned, or not taken advantage of, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other ones are um, 
are related to the containment. Uh, the uh, it's crystal clear that the containments leaked <laughs> at, at Fukushima. If they didn't leak, there would have been no radiation releases. Um, and the NRC is still assuming that the American reactors won't leak. Um, they they assume that uh, um, that all of the systems work, and that um, uh, therefore we don't have to do any major modifications. And on that note, we're going to take a pause for the uh, commercial break. And uh, one of the things that Arnie just mentioned was the nuclear plants on the Missouri River. And we had a major flood. Uh, the last major flood had those surrounded by water and bulging Dam. So that was a near meltdown in that situation back in three minutes. And the interesting thing, Arnie, is that we live in an upside-down world right now, and everything is, is upside down, and, and they try to make people that talk out that actually have sanity as being insane because they're telling the truth, and they try to demonize people that are doing that. But that's uh, an aside we don't need to go down necessarily right now because uh, Arnie's going to share with us some more lessons learned. And by the way, everybody listening on rbnrepublicbroadcasting.org, you can listen to archives of previous Arnie visits to uh, Capital Forum. And I would recommend everybody subscribe to the archives, and you can check out other great shows on RBN. And also in the second hour, we're going to have a show on uh, genetically modified organisms, and uh, you'll want to tune into the second hour of today's show as well. Arnie, uh, back to your lessons learned, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, well, we we're just let's finish up that issue of the, the cooling water to the power plants. The um, um, so one, you can flood them, and, and you know people in. Uh, in Missouri and Nebraska don't think they're going to get a tsunami, but if a dam were to break, uh, you would have the same thing as a tsunami. And again, you know, these are low probability events with enormous consequences. And nobody thought a 65 foot wall of water would hit the, uh, the Daiichi unit. So, um, but the flip side of that is the pumps along the water are susceptible to flooding. Um, they, uh, I, I've said, geez, like a week after the accident on CNN, I told uh, um, I told America for the first time it wasn't about the diesels getting wiped out. They would have failed anyway because you know you got a cooling pump on your front of your car. The cooling pump for the diesels are the pumps along the water, and they had been destroyed. Well, the NRC isn't doing a darn thing about those. Um, that's hmm. not even uh, something they're looking at to solve in the next five years. So you could put the diesel engines a mile away from the facility up and, and out of harm's way, but what you're indicating is they would still fail anyway because they would not be cooled by the, by their design. Right, right. The one thing that saved um, Daiichi 5 and 6 was one diesel was air-cooled, and um, that diesel didn't flood. It was in a location that didn't flood, and it had fans instead of relying on the ocean. And the guys, um, Herculean effort by a bunch of heroes, and I, I, my hats are off to the the people that stayed behind at, at uh, Daiichi and Daini, the two the, the two reactor sites that were mo worst hit. Really saved Japan and saved the world. And these guys were running jumpers from one plant to the other. As one plant started to, to heat up, they'd run the jumpers over there, cool it down a little bit, run the jumpers back to the other unit. Um, so they were... Um, you know, they're working in a, they had aftershocks. They didn't know whether their families were alive because they couldn't get communication to the outside world, high radiation, explosions, and they worked through it to save the country. So, um, but yeah, the, these, these diesels, and it runs up and down the coast. There was, uh, uh, 14 nuclear plants and all of them lost at least one diesel, not because the diesels were flooded, but because the uh, cooling water to the diesels was wiped out by the tsunami. Now, that's a pretty big lesson. When you lose 24 out of 37 diesels because of the, the tsunami knocked out the cooling water, you would think that in the United States we'd do something about that. But it's not even what we call a Tier 1 uh, concern by the NRC. They call it a Tier 3, which they're going to address 5 or 10 years out. Amazing, and what you indicated is a simple fix to that situation. Solution would be to switch out the uh, water cooled to air cooled engines. They may be a little bit less efficient, and there's trade offs to that. But uh, if <laughs> if you have something that's reliable, no matter what happens, then that's a huge, huge plus. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Now you also indicated that the, you, you wanted uh, another level of governance because it seems like these uh, the industry and the uh, obviously the uh, utility companies are not in the best situation as far as handling with 
No, they're not. The, the electric companies are not set up to to handle disasters like this. This shouldn't be thrown on their lap, even though they call they never they um, provided the nuclear power plants. They don't have the facility or the means to actually uh, deal with this situation. Yeah, you know, I, one of my lessons, my takeaways from the trip to Japan was that uh, uh, maybe Tokyo Electric can run a power plant. Let's set that aside for a minute. But they certainly are up against probably one of the most uh, difficult engineering challenges in history, and they're, they are totally incompetent to um, to address it. They're not engineers. You know, they don't think outside the box. So what I recommended when I was over there was that um, – uh, it's already nationalized. You know, Tokyo Electric's already nationalized. But just spin off the Daiichi site and um, and give it to a project management company that's in it with an engineering focus. And um, they would probably be inside the nuclear village because there's not many people like me um, outside the nuclear village. But then they should have an independent oversight group. And it shouldn't be the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, whose charter, by the way, is not to be a watchdog, but is to promote nuclear power. But they should get really independent people to sit on the board to give guidance and oversight um, to this project management team. Now, I was talking about that speech to the Diet, and um, Tokyo Electric had no engineering imagination. You know, you were... You, you worked on, on airplanes, and you know you've got to have people think outside the box and come up with creative solutions. And they just can't do that without independent experts looking over their shoulders. That's amazing. And uh, everybody, uh, please support RBN. Uh, you can exchange some Federal Reserve notes for some gold and silver at Republic Trading Group. And uh, please, please spread the message because uh, we have one goal on RBN is try to get the truth out. Each host on the show has their own opinions, but the, the main goal is to try to get the information out uh, so people can make up their own minds on what the situation is. Back in three minutes. Today's Sunday, September 23rd, 2012, and we're visiting with Arnie Gunnarsson from fairwinds.org, and that is fair, F-A-I-R-E, winds.org. And Arnie, I mentioned there needs to be a lot of other people exposing this information, and we had a guest on last week, Christina and she's known as the Rad Chick, and her website is fukushimafacts.com. And she does a really good job of getting all the information out about what you're uh, putting out, as well as some other experts and uh, and some grassroots effort as well. So she's doing a tremendous job, and we applaud her effort and hope uh, more and more people step up to the plate and help Arnie and uh, Christine and others uh, get the word out. Because this is, uh, unfortunately, Arnie, this is a gift that may keep giving for the rest of our lives and then future generations if we don't learn our lessons here and start making changes, not only in Fukushima, but in our own backyards, we could be having similar situations. And uh, one of the questions I asked you during the break was, do you have any concerns when you fly, especially to Japan, because these aircraft have been flying in and out of Japan for years, and uh, since this event, they've been collecting radiation. I would think it might be in the ventilation system. We had um, um, aviation mechanics contacting us last year, March, April, May, um, who had detected high levels of radiation in the compressors that um, uh, an airplane has held at about um, 2,500 pounds, uh, 2,500 feet of the pressure that's at 2,500 feet. And to do that, when you're way up high, they have to compress the atmosphere and run it through filters and pump it into the airplane. And we know that back in um, March, April, and May of last year, um, several planes landed in the United States and the People got off, and they were radioactive, and uh, it, it went away pretty quickly. But that would also imply the filters were radioactive, and we found that. We had uh, radiation mechanics contacting us and uh, telling us that the, the filters on the airplanes were, um, were highly contaminated. They had Geiger counters, too, and they were qualified to use them. Um, we tried to get uh, those, um, those filters, but the um, aviation companies wouldn't allow the, uh, the, these guys to send them, and, and it's difficult uh, you know, for job retention and stuff like that to, to sneak out a filter and send it to us. So we never got a filter, but we have all this data from uh, aviation mechanics that indicate last year, not, not this year, but last year, March, April, May, the, the planes on those polar routes over to Japan and um, China and Taiwan and South Korea and also Australia, we're, um, we're coming back uh, with contaminated air filters. 
So now, once again, is this a concern for us? If, say, for instance, we want to take a chip, trip to Japan or, or wherever in the world, is this something that we need to be concerned with? You know, I'm not worried now. Uh, I, I just flew to Japan and back, and I wasn't worried about the air quality on the plane. Um, and um, uh, I, I know I picked up a couple millirem as I flew, but it was external from cosmic rays and oh, over my entire body as opposed to localized like a hot particle. Um, but I was very concerned back in uh, you know, March, April, and May of, of last year when the accident was off-gassing uh, an enormous amount of uh, radioactivity. Can a person wear a dosimeter when you go on a trip like that or, or have, think they're exposed at all? Is that a good idea? If a person's really concerned about that, you know, obviously the average person wouldn't do that, but there are people that uh, want to avoid these things in all, all situations. So is that, a, is that an option? Um, you can, and you'll, you'll find you'll pick up uh, – something on the order of two millirem on a, on a flight to Japan, maybe three. Um, you know, the flight crews actually um, are monitored and, and uh, have, um, you know, have, have picked up radiation for years. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, again, you know, it's, it's cosmic radiation that you'd be exposed to whether or not you were, um, uh, whether or not Fukushima Daiichi had happened or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're if you were willing to take the risk before the accident, there's really no no change in risk after the accident at this point. Again, March, April, May of last year was a different story. Okay. Um, now we hear uh, reports that, uh, that there's a city called Kawasaki in Japan, and the mayor is actually I don't know if he's proud or defending or justifying, but he's he's indicating that uh, they're feeding radiated food to the school children on purpose. So they can learn about the dangers of radiation. If I'm not mistaken, do you know anything about that situation? Uh, yes, you know it's happening throughout the Fukushima prefecture and the surrounding prefectures, where there's um, it's a, almost viewed as a patriotic duty to keep these farmers in business. So therefore, people, uh, especially uh, you know towns and governments, are trying to buy from farmers who are selling contaminated food, um, and um, there's a lot of social stigma in the school systems. Teachers are being told to ostracize kids whose parents don't want to eat the food. Um, I, I, when I was over, in, one of the most moving things I had when I was in Japan last week was um, a woman came up to me in tears out in, the, out in the hallway after I gave my speech, and she said, I want to thank you. And her English was, was very good. And she said that, uh, she had wanted. She lived in in Fukushima City, and and she had wanted to move. And her husband said, "No, the government tells me everything is safe." And she says, "Well, you know, we're going to get divorced. I'm going to take our kids, and I'm moving with you or without you." And that they had this dialogue for a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, he agreed to to watch Fairwind's videos. And after watching Fairwind's videos, she said, "I'm coming with you." So she credits Fairwind's videos as saving her marriage. <laughs> I didn't know I was in the marriage counseling. But, but, you know, it's common there where the, the women are concerned about next generation and, and, and their kids. And um, what we're seeing is a real schism between the, the, the men who are, are sort of authoritarian and, the, you know, this is a hierarchical c country who want to believe the government, and the women realize that the government's been lying to them. So we're, we're seeing a, a breakdown in family structure and a breakdown in government structure because, you know, essentially they've alienated half the registered voters in the, uh, in the, in the country. The women are leading the, um, uh, the protest movement in Japan right now. And justifiably so. You know, they're concerned about their family, and then uh, the motherly instinct really takes over in situations like this, thank goodness. You know, we've seen um, an increase in... Um, um, they're not, they're not tumors. They're called nodules in the thyroid. And um, I, I had said in a video we put up oh, geez, almost a year ago that um, yeah, kids would be more susceptible than adults and young girls would be more susceptible than boys. And, and no one knows why the girl-boy difference, but certainly young people with their rapidly growing cells are more prone to cancers and, and, and uh, these lumps that are precancerous. Well, we're finding now that uh, that girls are having as much as twice as many thyroid lumps as mm -hmm. boys. Uh, so, yeah, the moms had a real legitimate reason to get their families out of there. And, by the way, the website is Fair Winds, and Fair spelled with an E on the end, and that's fairwinds.org. So 
I'd recommend everybody that's checking this information out, please check out his website. And uh, Arnie and Maggie are doing a tremendous job of getting the word out in, uh, on um, various media outlets, and they put most of that up on their website. So a great resource to uh, keep informed about what's going on in this situation. Um, now, for people that have been contacting me wanting to know if their produce is safe, if, if they could send it to a lab someplace, if, you know, a lot of people are a, even putting in greenhouses, and, and justifiably so, because we never know what the future holds. This, this, this is a one-off event, and it may or may not be affecting each and every one of us right now, but sooner or later, there could be events happening in our backyard. So what can we be doing now? Are greenhouses part of the answer? Is getting in a, a relationship with a local lab? What, what what should we be doing now to uh, circumvent this if it happens to us? Well, I would. Um, uh, I'm not personally. I'm not buying any f- produce from Japan, and I'm uh, not buying any fish from the Pacific. You know, I'm eating from the Atlantic. Um, but you know, as far as you know, we have a lot of organic farmers in Vermont, and and we're at a point now where this radiation is pretty well evenly distributed, and we can't run and we can't hide. Um, now, if Unit 4 blows, that's a, then we're back to, uh, you know, March 11th last year, but, but, you know, keep an eye on Unit 4, of course. But short of that, it's in the soil, and it's not going to go away. So we're kind of, we're, we're going to, we're going to live with this background radiation and, until it decays away in a couple hundred years. And, and that's, that's just life in the nuclear era. It's, it's unfortunate, but I don't know how to, how to get away from it? You know, I had a I had someone say they were leaving uh, uh, Oregon and they were moving to Louisiana, and I said, "Well, have you have you looked at the cancer statistics in Louisiana?" <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, oh, we hate to laugh it. about that, Arnie, but it's, we're, we're living you, in such you a get to the point where you run away from one and you wind up locating next to another. So I, I guess I get to the point where you can't run and you can't hide anymore. Right, but there, there probably are certain mitigation things we could do. I, I would suggest maybe uh, looking into zeolites or, or boron or different elements you could put into the soil that you might want to put into your garden. I, I think there are some solutions towards that, isn't there, Arnie? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about this last time. I, uh, zeolite is really good at removing cesium, but it also removes other things, so you wind up having to supplement. And if you're willing to supplement, then, then uh, zeolite is effective. I wonder, would that be, we talked about that, doing that internally, but I guess my question was towards uh, putting that in your garden. Would that would, would that also uh, chelate and, and absorb the minerals where your plants wouldn't be able to absorb the minerals in? Um, or do you know the answer uh, to that? I, I'm, I'm out of my pay grade here, sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what are some other lessons learned that uh, we could uh, be doing right now that we're not doing here in the United States? Oh. Um, well, let's talk about the, uh, these uh, 23 reactors. Uh, you, you don't have any within you know, 100 miles of you, but but up and down the East Coast, there's a whole bunch of reactors that are identical to uh, Fukushima and Daiichi, and also near Chicago as well. Um, and what the uh, for years people had known that the containments were too small. These this, these 23 reactors, the containment is one sixth the size of, of other containments. So the NRC stuck vents on the side of it, and um, the theory was that if the containment was in jeopardy, you'd open up and let the radioactive gases out. Now, that seems to me to be counterproductive to what a containment is all about. But the NRC is now studying whether those vents should be allowed to continue. And um, this is amazing. It shows the pressure that the nuclear industry is applying to the NRC. Um, they are uh, saying, well, we should put a, a vent, which is essentially, you know, a pipe, a hole in the side of the containment with a valve on it, open and close it. But we don't want to spend the money to put a filter on that vent mm. so that that would trap the radiation that was released. So the NRC is in the process of allowing um, what they call hardened vents, and but no filter on the vent. So when they open this pipe up, the radiation that's in the containment is going to come right out. Now, one of the commissioners, um, the, um, there's two commissioners that are so pro-nuclear they could, they may as well go to work for Westinghouse. But, um, and that's uh, Commissioner Magwood and Commissioner um, Spinicki. Um, anyway, Commissioner Spinicki said, "Well, we don't need vents because we know there'll never be any core damage to release the radiation." 
we don't need filters, rather, because we know there'll be no core damage. Well, if there's no core damage, you don't need the vent at all. So, this is a, you know, she said, well, we need the vents, but we're really, I'm sure what the message to the industry was, is I'm going to vote against putting a filter on this because I don't want to run up the uh, the cost to, um, to generate uh, nuclear power. It's really a trade-off. You know, you can make nuclear plants much safer, but they can't compete economically in the marketplace, um, even now, uh, without all these PMI fixes. Nuclear is not the low-cost provider. It's um, hydroelectric and, and, um, and, and uh, natural gas are low-cost providers now. Nuclear is maybe third or fourth. And if you throw in all these TMI mods, um, I'm sorry, Fukushima mods, um, you're, um, you're likely to cause these plants to shut down, especially the small units like, like Fort Calhoun up there on the Missouri. Um, they just can't amortize the cost for these modifications over, um, over a very small power output. And you know, the industry doesn't want to shut down nuclear plants, uh, even though they're uneconomical. So we're, we're stuck in a bind right now. As citizens, I think we've got to demand more of our legislature, but um, pretty much every legislator is, um, you know, is receiving funds from the nuclear industry. And it's not Republican, Democrat. They, they all are, uh, with the exception of maybe three or four that, um, that really are, are concerned about nuclear safety. And unfortunately, that's not an atypical when you get into any major industry. It seems like that's the situation, and you indicated they, they if they're not working from, they should be. But uh, ultimately, if you if you look at uh, where their campaign donations and where their money comes from, it's it's these big industries, and that's why they they send them a favorable result. But, but uh, a big part of why the nuclear industry is there is because it is subsidized by the taxpayers' money, and that's you know, why, I, like you said. I had a, I listened to a, an eloquent 16-minute speech by uh, um, by Dennis Kucinich, who's a really uh, very liberal Democratic uh, representative up in uh, the, the Cleveland area, and he's through redistricting, he's lost his his, his seat for the uh, starting in January. But he has actually made a liaison with so so he's he's a liberal Dem. There's no doubt about it, and he'll say that right out. But he's actually made a liaison with the conservative Tea Party Republicans on this issue of subsidizing these nuclear power plants. Now, you and I right now are signing notes, um, loan guarantees, so that people in Georgia and South Carolina can build nuclear power plants. Well, when those notes go sour, and they will go sour because the cost is so astronomical compared to other, other means of producing power, you and I are on the hook for it. So it's actually a link between the uh, liberal Democrats who don't want nuclear power and the conservative Tea Party Republicans who don't want federal involvement uh, that is likely to put an end to loan guarantees, which um, uh, is certainly uh, you know, an example of the, probably the most subsidized um, uh, industry in the world. Wow. And if you're going to have to have welfare, you don't need welfare to these corporate entities, these globalist corporations, which have, you know, literally print money out of thin air. So <laughs> I could see his point on that and why that correlation came to exist. You know, One we of the always things... talk about gridlock in Washington, and here's an yeah. example of spanning the gridlock, and, and I thought that was a really um, positive example. Exactly, and sometimes if they're trying to do bad stuff to us, gridlock is a positive thing, but, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes not. Uh one of the report, one of the few reports that did come out of what the government is testing, and, and that's one of the problems we have here is the government's not releasing information. Is the tuna situation at, at 15 out of 15? I believe tested positive. Where where is the current results? Because this was uh, I don't know by now. It's probably been over a year old results. So what is the latest on that? Are we getting any good information of what the government has seen as far as food and air and water? Are they giving us any information at all? Um, everything you said is exactly right. The last tuna uh, data was a year old, and nothing has been published since then. Um, now, I don't know. Um, it's hard to believe that researchers don't have the data. I'm sure that as a follow-up from that, somebody was collecting tuna data. But um, whether the journals are sitting on it, and we know scientific journals have stopped publication of some of the data. Hey, Arnie, I hate to interrupt you right there, but uh, we, we must stop for the break. Well, 
Welcome back to Capital Pharma. We're going to cut the music short so we can uh, get back to Arnie because we have limited time left with Arnie. We want to uh, let him finish his thoughts. Uh, what I would recommend everybody do, if, if uh, you enjoy listening to Arnie, don't just sit back and enjoy it. Actually contribute because Arnie's out there on the front line doing this. He and his wife are not uh, profiting from this, but they do need help uh, financing the website because bandwidth servers, all this takes money, and, and they're spending their own personal money, and they'd like to have a donation come in to help finance that, but to, to offset some of their personal investments. So if you go to fairwinds.org, please use the uh, chip-in uh, PayPal or, uh, and uh, help uh, Arnie and, and Maggie finance their operation there to keep them going because a lot of people are um, reposting their information, and uh, even if you rep- repost their information, please put a link in your uh, in your description to back to their website, and that will help Arnie and uh, help keep them uh, going and keeping this uh, good information flowing so we know what's going on in the nuclear world. Arnie, back to you. Well, let's finish up our thought on the on the scientists and uh, measuring in fish and and um, the soils and and in. Uh, um, it seems like especially what's going on in the Pacific right now. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure the scientists are taking data, and I I'm sure that they are trying to get their data published. Um, we're seeing a lot of resistance in the major um, uh, the major scientific journals, the peer reviewed journals. Um, to allowing this information to get through because, again, the peer-reviewed journals are controlled by this nuclear priesthood, so it's it's difficult, and, and hopefully some more good science will come up that we can uh, talk about next time. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was this, this nuclear village and how it's co-opted the, um, the National Academy of Sciences uh, study on uh, Fukushima now. They're not supposed to report back to Congress till 2014, so there's um, essentially 18 months here before um, the report goes to Congress. But already you can see where it's going. You know, the the deck is stacked. All the people on the um, on the National Academy's uh, um, oversight panel are all uh, either academians that work with the nuclear industry, and a couple of them are actually retired nuclear industry guys, and. The people they're asking to appear in front of them are Tokyo Electric and the Institute of Nuclear Preparedness. Um, and so we're seeing the data, the evaluators of the data and the people providing the data are basically agreeing ahead of time that, uh, to the outcome of the report. And, and that concerns me. It's really not going to be an objective report the way it's stacked right now. Yeah, and that's a shame. And, and thank goodness that uh, whistleblowers such as yourself or just informers such as yourself are uh, dis- uh, dispersing information that we need to know and, and need to become watchdogs. And I think no matter what the industry is, Arnie, we need good people to actually get engaged in the system and start watching. You know, we need to watch our legislators and we need to watch these gov- these um, corporations. Well, everybody's just sitting back and, and, and waiting for somebody else to uh, do the job for us. Well, we need to look in the mirror and say, hey, it's up to me. It's up to good people like yourself and Christina and uh, good programs like uh, the ones that are on RBN to actually spread the message and and try to help uh, change the world and, and start moving in a more positive direction. And that's one of the really takeaways I noticed in your Japan tour is you told them they had an opportunity to move into the alternate energy and be a world leader. Yeah. You know, and and uh, one, they should do it because, you know, considering that their country is highly seismic and of all the places on the planet where you'd want to not put a nuclear plant, it's Japan. But the flip side of it is they can make money. I mean, the Germans are exporting more to China than they're receiving from China. Well, what do the Germans know? They've figured out a way of making money. So, uh, yeah, I think if the Japanese wanted to um, think outside the box, they could become world leaders in a, in a renewable technology. The three most significant statements that I think were made in this was number one the air filters and planes obviously and just to reiterate you can find these links on any news to sh- share them around on social media Gunderson airplane air filters coming back from Australia were contaminated with Fukushima radioactivity in the months after 311 what Arnie said was we have all this data from aviation mechanics that indicate last year, March, April, May, that the planes that were on those polar routes over to Japan and China and Taiwan and South Korea and also Australia were coming back with contaminated air filters. 
The second point of significance was what he said about the scientific journals that have stopped publication of some of the data about contamination from the Fukushima disaster. A lot of resistance to releasing this information. I can attest, having worked in the medical field and having sat on a medical review board for a scientific journal, that even if there were, I guess you would say, um, personality differences between the author of certain uh, publications or articles and the people that sat on the board, that sometimes the people on the board would purposely drag their feet and not approve these articles for distribution. Usually there's uh, seven or eight or nine or ten people that sit on a medical review board for a scientific journal. It's usually not a paid position. They can come from various backgrounds. Usually it's a, a wide variety of backgrounds. They'll have certain people that are in university settings and some that will work for um, like in, in the medical field, for instance, in uh, scientific testing equipment. And I saw firsthand how people would try to sabotage others' work if they work for competing companies. So you can just imagine if any of these people are paid employees of the nuclear industry, how they would want to keep this information from going public. The third thing when Tom Ritter asked him about the fallout that's here already, Arnie Gunderson said that we know it landed here and now we have to deal with it. A couple other stories of importance today. Hawaii employing radiation detectors at debris landing sites. This was posted in Informable. This last week, officials in Hawaii received a $15,000 portable radiation detection device paid for with federal grants which will make it quicker to test potentially dangerous marine debris. Not only do you know the amount of radiation that is being emitted from this source, but also know the isotope, explains Court Chambers, EMS medical analyst. Federal and state agencies have similar technology and are working together to recover tsunami debris. So where are the radiation detectors for Washington, Oregon, and California? Please share this article around with anybody that you know who lives on the west coast and may be affected by the tsunami debris. Another article of interest, and I'm so glad that this is happening. After tracking radiation levels in Fukushima, SafeCast is now measuring air quality in the states. When a nuclear crisis came on the heels of the March 2011 tsunami that devastated Japan, there was an outcry from those seeking accurate information about radiation levels in various prefectures. The situation prompted a group of friends to launch a crowdsourced Geiger counting effort which eventually grew into SafeCast, a network for collecting and mapping radiation measurements across the world. Now with a $400,000 Night's News Challenge grant, SafeCast will expand its efforts into air quality testing starting in Detroit, Los Angeles, and Tokyo. Co-founder Sean Bonner says the project will help identify good and bad air quality on a granular neighbor-by-neighborhood -neighborhood level. He's also hoping to track changes in air quality over short periods of time. If there's any way that you can support the efforts of SafeCast, please check out their website. And if you live in either Detroit or Los Angeles, you may want to look into becoming a volunteer and having one of these Geiger counters attached to your car. We talked about this briefly on Thursday. Scientific American is running this article, Idaho Wildfire Roars Through Former Uranium Mine Site. Warning 616 on YouTube. We'll have some new information coming out about this in the next day or two. This is the wildfire in east central Idaho that's burned through three former mining sites containing traces of radioactive thorium and uranium. I read in another article that there were actually piles of uranium and thorium that have burned. You can also find articles about this in the Chicago Tribune in Reuters. And hopefully we'll have an update soon. They have told people that live in these areas to avoid going outside, and if they do go outside, they need to wear masks. Idaho environmental officials said smoke pollution, which has blanketed the area for more than a month, is the most pressing hazard. They renewed a call for the area residents to stay indoors and wear masks when outdoors. This is very unhealthy air. Unfortunately, there are no crowdsourced radiation monitors in that area of Idaho or Montana, and Billings is directly downwind of this fire. Another news story 
that needs to go viral. This is absolutely sickening. The Army experimented on people in poor neighborhoods in St. Louis during the Cold War by spraying them with radioactive chemicals. We're going to play a clip from the I-Team in St. Louis that broke this story. The woman who did the research will be pre presenting all of her data and materials today at a seminar, and we're going to probably devote a good chunk of the show on Thursday to this topic. So we'll go ahead and play the clip. Quickly become the most viewed article on KSDK.com, and it's only been on our website since late last night. Our I-team has learned the United States military conducted secret tests on thousands of people in St. Louis. Ryan Dean joins us from the area where the testing was most prominent. He breaks down the I-team report. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Jennifer. I am standing where the once infamous pruitt Igo housing complex once stood. It was torn down in the 70s, but at one time it was home to 10,000 low-income people. And according to research that will go public today, uh, this is where most of the testing happened back in the 50s and 60s. Now, a sociologist professor at St. Louis Community College, Lisa Martina Taylor, has made it her life's work to uncover details of the Army's ultra-secretive experiments carried out in St. Louis. She says the Army's sprayed zinc cadmium sulfide into the air. She claims people living at the complex unknowingly inhaled this compound morning, noon, and night so the government could measure its effects on their lungs. The cover story back then was the Army was testing smoke screens to protect cities from the Russian attack during the Cold War. Now, the truth, according to Martino Taylor, was it was much more sinister than that. Pretty shocking. Um, the level of duplicity and secrecy um, um, clearly, they went to great lengths to deceive people. Now the, prof the professor says what happened, what the Army did back in the 50s and 60s here in St. Louis violated medical ethics and its military's own policies. Now, what I urge you to do is go on ksdk.com. A more in-depth piece is there. You'll see by the I-team. It was done last night. It will lay out everything that uh, this, this report talks about. That's on ksdk.com under headlines. Now, if you are interested in hearing from Martino Taylor, she's actually doing a presentation tonight at St. Louis Community College, the Merrimack campus, and that's at 3.30. More information on that is also going to be found on KSDK.com. That is the very latest. I'm Ryan Dean, News Channel 5. Now today is also Yom Kippur, which is the holiest of holy days for the Jewish faith. Israel has shut down everything, their airspace, their trains. Everything is shut down today, but that's normal for this holiday. Israel had been attacked by Egypt and Syria in the 1970s on Yom Kippur. Whether or not they will be attacked again remains to be seen. And if you remember, former State Department official Steve Pizenik said that September the 25th would be the start of World War III. So we'll see what happens. There's been no greater time in history to share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man. Stay safe, everyone. Birds are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither while they pass, they slip away across the universe.